This is CBC Here and Now. Ice conditions have, have cut off money completely for, for the fishermen. Blocked in by pack ice, fish harvesters are growing desperate. You've got people looking for credit, never look for credit in their lives. Why is Beatrice Hunter in jail for protesting Muskrat Falls while no one from this has been charged? Glenn Payette with the answer. Unemployed, Randy Sims gets a layoff notice from the Liberals. Well, it looks like we're cracking the 20s tomorrow, shaping up to be a gorgeous Friday for most of the island. Maybe some thunder showers for Eastern Labrador. All the details are coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We start again tonight with the ice that's jamming the bays on the northeast coast of the island. Yes, but there is some good news today in La Cie. Our uh, Here and Now, Colleen Connors is live at La Cie tonight. So Colleen, what has happened? Well, Debbie, that's right. I'm right here on the uh, side of the water in the harbor in La Cie. Bend is working on their boat right next to me here tonight. And the reason we're here at this view tonight is like, I want to show you something. All along the water here, if you look closely, you can see all the crab boats and they're docked, which is very uncommon this time of year. So if you really look closely, you can really see the thick sea ice that's making those boats stay in here by the water. And that's because they just can't get through this thick sea ice. But you're right, there is some good, good news. Two ships did get back to port today. And I want to show you what that looked like earlier this morning. So when I first arrived in La Cie, we went to the lookout spot where you see this footage here tonight. And two boats were so stuck in that thick ice, they were just barely moving, trying to get back to the shore where I am now. And uh, the two boats are Sean and Evan and the Endeavour. And they started to move very slowly through that thick ice, trying really hard not to damage their boat, of course. Uh, sometimes you could hear the big crunch and the big sound of them hitting that ice as they were coming in. Everyone was up at the lookout watching today. The wind shifted just enough so they felt they were able to get back to shore. These boats have been stuck in the ice for days now. It took long over an hour for them to get through. They finally made their way back to dock. Now, one man that was up there watching, Justin Giles, he was on a boat that was stuck last night, and he was up watching these other two boats come in. And he says, you know, this has been such a rough go for the harvesters in this area. The time is getting short, right, for crab, right? So to get the season extended now to the 15th of July, good job they have, I say. Think you're going to get out at all this year? I'm, I'm hoping so. We'll get out in the next couple of days again if the wind wants to go off, right? So hopefully we will do it. So of course, Giles and many other fishermen are hopeful that they will get some crab before the season ends. And we'll talk more about how the fact that these boats are stuck in the harbor, how that is affecting this community. That's coming up later in the show. Live in La Cie, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Speaking of ice, here's a preview of a story we'll have a little later on here and now. The International Ice Patrol is wrapping up for the season, but reporter Zach Gowdy got to tag along on a flight this week, all the way to the northern tip of the Labrador coast. The Ice Patrol keeps tabs on icebergs that could intersect with busy maritime shipping lanes. But with thousands of pieces of ice in every direction, one of the biggest challenges is identifying the bergs that could pose the biggest danger. We try to stick to two different shapes to keep it simple. It's, we call it tabular or non-tabular. Uh, tabular is the ones that you see that are kind of flat, like you know the Coca-Cola commercial pancake style with little penguins on it dancing around. Uh, Non-tab is basically anything else, like you know the big sandcastle looking ones or the ones that look like craters. I mean, it gets pretty wild out here as far as shapes go, so we enjoy it. And there's more on this tonight. In 20 minutes, we will be back in the air with the U.S. Coast Guard for more incredible video of all the ice along the coastline. Inu Nation leaders took to the Confederation building late this afternoon. They're frustrated, they say, by the lack of funding from the federal and provincial governments. Now here and now is Mark Quinn is live outside of Confederation Building. Mark? 
Well, Jeremy, they spoke about things in general. They're generally frustrated with the way that kids, their kids from their communities are being taken care of. But very specifically today, they were in town for meetings with federal and provincial officials to talk about a specific project they're working on. They received funding for it last year. It's a project to build a group home in their own community so they can keep their children at home in their community and take care of them there instead of sending them out of their communities to other communities outside of Labrador. They say about 60 children are being taken care of in non-Indigenous uh, communities outside of Labrador. And they say that this funding has stalled, it's dried up. They even word it as a promise is not being keepin, has not been kept. Uh, and they're saying that that's a real problem. That's the specific problem they wanted to talk about today is this funding for this group home. In broader terms, they wanted to talk about funding in general for all kinds of projects and the way that Indigenous people are treated in Labrador. And here are what two of the people who are here today said. Well, where is the money coming from for the Canada 150 celebrations? There's $500 million been spent for the Canada 150 celebrations. And we can't even get a cent for our communities to try and help our children. We're coming. And I'm really pleased to say that we're coming. That's enough. The dying of our youth is enough. And I really have to say that. I don't know how many times we buried our, our own people. I buried two of my own last week, and that's enough. And of course, that's Simeon Jacopesh, and he called for an inquiry into the way children from Labrador are treated by uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, the services they receive. And that, that call for an inquiry was repeated by almost every single leader we spoke with here today. They're all saying they support that idea of inquiry. They say it's time to look into the way children are treated, specifically Indigenous children are treated in Newfoundland and Labrador. I did get a chance to speak with uh, the, child, uh, the Children's uh, Affairs Minister here in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, Sherry Gambin-Walsh, and she said that uh, it's not really for her to say if an inquiry is appropriate. And when I pressed a bit and asked if she believes that it would be a good thing to have an inquiry, she said she'd have to study it more before she was convinced that it was a good use of provincial money. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Well, Randy Sims is out of a job. The mayor of Mount Pearl and former Open Line radio host was let go by the provincial liberals yesterday. For a little over a year, Sims worked doing research and communications in the government member's office. He says he was told that the office is being restructured. I think they're uh, going to shrink staff, and I was like the last guy in sort of thing, so I guess I'm the first guy out. So I got a two-week notice of a layoff yesterday, and... Uh, last evening actually and that's it i'm not uh, happy about it or anything but uh, you know i'm not i'm not mad or upset it's the story of two protests. Muskrat Falls protester Beatrice Hunter is in prison for refusing to follow a judge's order. Meanwhile, an investigation is ongoing into a violent protest at DFO headquarters in St. John's. So, what's the difference? Here and now's Glenn Payette explains. Today in St. John's, a protest to support jail protester Beatrice Hunter. This lady did nothing wrong but to stand up to what she believed in. Hunter is in prison at HMP in St. John's. Like other protesters, she was arrested for violating an injunction not to protest at the Muskrat Falls construction site. In order to be released, she had to agree to stay a kilometer away. She refused. There's only so long people can be suppressed. Lawyer Cletus Flaherty has represented protesters in the past. I have to say that you know, I have nothing but sympathy for Ms. Hunter and her supporters. Uh, they're out there fighting for their way of life. They're fighting for the environment. But, and there is a big but here. Just as freedom of expression is important to our society, so is the rule of law. So unfortunately, when Miss Hunter uh, told, essentially told the court that she may not respect uh, the conditions put upon her, she's directly uh, going against challenging the authority of the court. And that's textbook contempt of court. Flaherty says Justice George Murphy really had no choice but to put Hunter in prison. Hunter has said she shouldn't be subject to colonial law. And if she doesn't believe that they should apply to her, then, you know, 
there are political avenues where she can, she can put forward her views and she can see change that way. In April, some fishermen smashed their way into the DFO building in St. John's. That has people wondering if the system is fair, given that there have been no charges laid in connection with that protest, and Hunter is in prison because she wouldn't agree to stay a certain distance away from Muskrat Falls. Flaherty says it's apples and oranges. The DFO protest is under investigation, and there still could be charges. I can tell you, in my experience, as a lawyer who has represented protesters. In situations where there is violence, as long as the police are able to identify the protesters who broke the law and there's sufficient evidence, those people are charged regardless whether or not they're from Labrador or from the island of Newfoundland. We should find out tomorrow if Hunter will remain in prison. She has a hearing slated for Supreme Court in Happy Valley Goose Bay in the morning. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. One of the drivers struck in a hit and run collision in St. John's last night followed the suspect driver to try and catch him. Now the crash happened on Allendale Road and when the alleged offending vehicle drove away, the driver of one of the damaged vehicles followed it to Memorial University. And that's where police arrested a 32 year old. He faces a string of charges, including driving while prohibited, driving without insurance or registration and leaving the scene of an accident. No one was injured in the collision. There's more evidence tonight that the Wabash mine may be a step closer to reopening. The United Steelworkers Union says it has reached a new five-year collective agreement with U.S.-based Tecora. That's Tecora Resources. And that is the company looking to restart the former mine. Right now, it's locked in creditor protection and court approval is still required for the company's proposal to reopen. But Tecora is advertising for people to work at the mine. It's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a drive through but this morning this SUV slammed through the dining room window of Luxury Estates, a Carboneer retirement home. No residents were in the room, but a few staff members were, and one of them was struck by flying glass, but we've since learned is okay. And the female driver was taken to hospital. A spokesperson for the home says it was chaotic for a few hours with extra staff having to be called in, but contractors and electricians are assessing the situation. Now another room has been approved for temporary dining, but the damaged room could be back in action as early as tomorrow. Trades unions are inching closer to a formal labor agreement on construction of a concrete gravity structure at Argentia. Union leaders have confirmed that a memorandum of understanding has been reached between the contractors building the structure for Husky and its partners and the three trades unions that will provide the workers. The gravity-based structure is a major component of the $2.2 billion West White Rose development. Two close-knit towns in central Newfoundland are thinking of becoming even closer. Botwood and Northern Arm have hired a consultant to study the future of the neighboring communities. Now that's a move that could lead to the amalgamation of the two towns. Here and now's Garrett Barry has that story. To drive from this council building in Northern Arm to the next one in Botwood would only take you about seven minutes. An example of the duplication between these two communities that a merger could fix. The proposal is on the table, but not everyone here is sure they want to tie the knot. Cut this building, you could cut a job or two. No small thing in a town this size. So when they speak about having one garbage collection, well, there, there are two gentlemen here that do that. Now what happens to them? Do they become part of that uh, enterprise or do they just become unemployed? For some, it's dollars and cents. Will taxes go up? Others wonder what Botwood has to offer. I'm not opposed, but I'm not in favor, like I say, until I hear the facts and what it really means. Uh, if the town benefits by doing it, great. If it doesn't, there's, there's hardly any purpose in changing things. Living here, you're already so close. Maybe a marriage just makes sense. My kids participate in, their, in all sorts of things in Batwood, from going to school to the stadium to the ball fields, whatever. So there's a lot of resources in Batwood that I'm indebted to, but this is a beautiful place to live. And I don't think amalgamation will change the way I live. 
it will take months before the future of these two communities is known for sure. But what's happening here today is probably a preview of conversations about to happen all across the province. Towns looking for cash and looking for ways to collaborate in an effort to save money. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Northern Arm. And like Garrett just said, amalgamation isn't just an idea that's happening in central Newfoundland. Right now, Labrador City and Walbush are also looking at becoming one town. A consultant has been hired there as well to study the options. The provincial government says it expects both reports to be completed sometime in July. The city of St. John's has just opened the brand new Paul Reynolds Centre here in Wedra Park. I'm Jeremy Eaton, I got a tour and I'll show you around. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. And welcome back to Here and Now. So I know that we all in this province feel like we pay a little bit too much up at the pumps, but a uh, few people in this province, uh, but we're getting off easy compared <laughs> to a uh, few other drivers in St. John's and Mount Pearl <laughs> recently. So I know that we're laughing, but we shouldn't be. But uh, they, uh, while they were, they filled up their gas car, they filled up their ga car with gas, sorry, they went in to pay for it. And while they were paying for their vehicles, thieves came and stole and they both of them. out of there, obviously. Uh, not great and police are saying 
needlessly, I think, but they're <laughs> really trying to drive it home. Don't leave your keys yeah. in your car when you're going to pay for your gas. Yeah, that's an expensive bit of gas there for sure. And a good lesson for all you folks out there, I guess, who will be filling up, maybe heading out uh, tomorrow in your cars because it's going to be a great day for it. If you can head out on the highway, head anywhere, it will be a great day. Let's have a look at the weather on the way. For tomorrow on the island, temperatures are looking fantastic for most areas. The mercury is dropping, however, though, in Lab West. And uh, a system is moving in on Friday night, and it's going to mean a pretty wet start to the weekend. So overnight tonight, there are a few showers moving across Labrador. Lab City will see some heavier showers at around midnight, looking at about two to four millimeters there. And that system will continue on across Labrador through the overnight hours. But you can see on the island, really not much happening. It's going to be a nice, clear night uh, and a nice, clear start to the day tomorrow. This is how your morning is shaping up. Some temperatures in St. John, six degrees, nice and clear right across the island. Six Single digit temperatures to start your day. Really cool in Nain, three degrees there. Lab City will start off the day with nine and some uh, and some showers will linger there as well. So this is how Friday is looking. You can see it's nice and clear across the island there as you start the day. In Labrador, though, temperatures will be dropping and you can see this band of showers that uh, will be uh, moving across Labrador throughout the day and a little bit more cloud cover moving in in Friday afternoon. And you can see as the day goes on, there's a system down here that will be closing in on the island for overnight tonight. Some heavier showers in Happy Valley Goose Bay and actually uh, some thunder showers there as well. So this is how St. John's is looking tomorrow morning, seven degrees, lots of sun when you head out the door, 20 degrees in the afternoon, 2021, mainly sunny skies, and it'll be quite a nice evening at around seven o'clock. It'll be sitting at about 16 degrees with some sun and cloud. Here's a look at some more temperatures across the island. A little bit cooler in the southern part of the Avalon, Fairyland and uh, Placentia sitting at 12 degrees as the high uh, tomorrow, but much nicer as you head north. 24 in Clarenville and Bonavista, and there's that 21 for St. John's tomorrow that I'm really looking forward to. In central, you can see these nice southwesterly winds. Uh, it's really good for uh, the area, Bayvert, Twillingate. It's going to help push some of that uh, pack ice away from the shoreline. So that's some good news uh, for fish harvesters in those areas. And look at those temperatures, 27 in Gander, Twillingate. What a great day to drive to Twillingate tomorrow for sure. Looking on the West Coast, a little bit cooler along the Southern coast, 14 degrees in Port of Basque, warmer as you go North, 21 in Gross Morn, gorgeous day in Humber Valley, 26 there. Moving on up to the Straits, St. Anthony is looking at a nice day tomorrow. Sun and cloud, 18 degrees. There's a chance of thunder showers in Cartwright tomorrow and a much better chance of thunder showers tomorrow in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's going to be a pretty muggy day there, about 5 to 15 millimeters expected and a good chance of seeing some thunder showers there later in the afternoon. Kind of chilly in uh, Nain tomorrow with a chance of showers and showers as well in uh, eastern Labrador, much colder, uh, western Labrador rather, much colder than what uh, they've been used to lately. Just 12 degrees as the high in Lab City tomorrow. So that's your Friday. But what about your Saturday? I'll have the long range details coming up. Thanks, Carolyn. The latest polls are painting an improving picture for the opposition PCs, and that may be part of the reason as why the issue of leadership is taking an intriguing twist. Now, former Premier Paul Davis announced last fall that he would step down once a successor was elected, but with the Tories at 40% support and Davis's popularity well ahead of Premier Dwight Ball, that's not so certain anymore. Here and now's Terry Roberts reports. Eight months ago, the knives were out for Paul Davis. There are some people in the party who want to have that leadership discussion. Uh, there is a division that I see occurring as a result of that and the potential for a stronger division that could happen. And I don't want that to happen. That's not in the best interest of our party. But today there are whispers all over that Davis might want another shot at being premier. Here's how he answered that today. It's not certainly that's in, in my game plan today. It's not there. 
uh, but I've agreed just to keep that door open ever so little bit and I would agree to uh, have a look at what the landscape is when the when those time comes but it's certainly not my plan I don't think I'm gonna run I don't have a plan to run I don't have a desire burning desire to run today uh, but I've agreed to keep the door open just that little bit that's not sitting well with this man I think mr. Davis does need to decide what job he's doing is he doing the job of pursuing you know being involved in a contest to effectively be the next leader and succeed himself or is he doing the job of being the official opposition leader while Davis may be encouraged by the latest polls, Crosby sees them as a wake-up call for the PCs. He's a lame duck leader. He's announced uh, he's handed in his letter of proposed resignation, and everyone knows that's the situation. So how can the voters get excited about an alternative to a failing government when we don't know what that alternative is? So that's another reason why Mr. Davis needs to make his mind up. I will make the commitment to these people who have contacted me that I'll wait to see what the lay of the land is and then we'll have that further conversation. But I can assure you today that I haven't changed my mind and I don't have any plans underway. Leadership will be all the talk this weekend at the Tory General Meeting in Gander. Davis expects a leadership convention next year. Crosby doesn't want to wait. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Now that those fishermen are back safely from the thick sea ice, what is going to happen to all those crab boats that are docked? I'll tell you about the community impact that's coming up.
Welcome back, everyone, and we return now to La Cie. The last boats that were stuck in the ice have made it back to port, but tying up is not all good news. Here now is Colleen Connors is live tonight in La Cie on the northeast coast of the islands. So Colleen, what's it mean for people there to have these boats tied up at the wharf? That's right. So you can see the boats all lined up, tied up behind me here this evening. And that's not really good news for almost mid-June in La Cie. And to paint a picture for you, so there's many people here in this community, stores, convenience stores, restaurants, families that depend on that money, that fishery to, to operate. And, and it's very late for them not to be out fishing. So everyone is depending on it. So, for example, there's an offloading company that works here that helps offload all the crab off the boats. This time last year, the owner of that company told me that he had offloaded 785,000 pounds of crab by now, by today, this time last year. But today, 785,000 pounds of crab, today they're at zero, absolutely nothing. And that really paints a picture for his business in particular as to what's happening. So let me show you what it looked like earlier. So this boat, of course, came back. All the crew got off, but it was a very clean boat. The crab nets, of course, were completely empty, and the crew got off very quickly and wanted to head home. But first they had to do one thing which you don't see very often, which is take all the bait off the boat. So that's what they're loading into these uh, containers here. That's bait at $1.90 a pound, and there's about that's about $10,000 per boat. That bait is then being recycled at this point. So the boat can't get out through that thick ice. It comes back, the bait gets taken off and put back in refrigeration. So that's a visual that you don't see very often. You want that bait gone, of course. And the owner of that offloading company, Gord Butt, takes that bait, puts it back into the refrigerator. And he says he's got 30 employees that are waiting on work. For the, uh, because, of these, because of these boats. He talks a little bit about that. Just have a listen to what he has to say about how difficult it's been. So, I mean, our workers now, what do we do with this? You're looking at them and they're coming to you and open for answers. I mean, you're optimistic, that's no more. The optimism is gone. I mean, we're just, you got to, you know, you got to look at it that there's not, nothing going to be here now, for this year anyway. So, of course, Bud is telling his employees who are calling him every day, wanting to know when they're going to get work. He says all you have to do is look out the bay. Look out and see if that thick ice is still out there, then that means there's no work. So for many people here in the community, they told me that their employment insurance checks started to run out in April. So that's almost two and a half months without any pay. Now that means that other things, other places and people in the community are noticing that, like the grocery stores. Um, you know, people can't afford uh, many things and it's really feeling an impact on the community here. Every business in town is affected and they're struggling to make ends meet. There's no doubt about that. And Neil Ward, he runs a store uh, in the community here and he says that these are really desperate times just let, have a listen to what he has to say about his customers well you got people looking for credit never look for credit in their lives they're coming in listen do you mind if I put groceries down till we get fishing do you mind if we do this and 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 it's a sad thing it's a sad day when a lot of people they're they got a lot of pride Newfoundlanders got a lot of pride they don't want to stoop to this level of saying you know we need a bit of help and, and I blow it off. I don't say much either. But, uh, and I understand where they're coming from. So tonight in La Cie, we have, of course, good news. These two boats came back to shore safe and sound. No one was injured. Everyone's got out of that thick sea ice as best they could. But, of course, the bad news is those boats are now docked. And many fishermen wanting to work but can't get the money and can't get the crab and it looks like a very grim few months for those that depend on it. Live in La Cie, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. While the sea ice in La Cie is a problem for fishermen, spotting an iceberg is still a thrill that lures many people to Newfoundland. But nobody does it quite like the International Ice Patrol. The small unit of the United States Coast Guard watches the sea from the sky, keeping track of icebergs that endanger ships in the North Atlantic. They use the latest technology, but much of this crucial work is still done by people with binoculars. Here and now's Zach Gowdy takes us on board. There's iceberg hunting, and then there's iceberg hunting. 
This berg towers above the endless sea ice as it begins the long voyage down the Labrador coast. Only a very few people get to see icebergs like this. They are the crew of the International Ice Patrol, and right now they have their work cut out for them. So today we're flying north, which is uh, always a busy flight. Every time it's a busy flight, just because all the icebergs are coming down the Labrador coast in the Labrador current. We found probably three or four hundred so far. The day begins at the St. John's International Airport. A massive Hercules C-130 is loaded with more than 20,000 kilos of fuel for the 10-hour round trip. The mission of the International Ice Patrol is to monitor the iceberg danger in the North Atlantic Ocean and to provide relevant iceberg warning products to the maritime community. The patrol may have a private plane, but this is no pleasure cruise. Inside the Hercules, you'll find none of the comforts of commercial air travel. It's extremely loud. Instead of a menu, the seat pockets contain life preservers and every spare inch of space is crammed with equipment. We take off and head north. Today, the patrol is going up and then down Iceberg Alley, the flow of ocean current that takes bergs from Greenland down the Labrador coast and on to Newfoundland. But that current intersects with one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. When we have icebergs in that area, we set an iceberg limit, which is basically saying if the ships stay to the south and to the east of that line, they'll stay out of the danger of iceberg collision. So they may have to adjust their course up to 400 miles out of their way to go around that dangerous area of icebergs. Sophisticated radar helps with ice detection, but up here there are millions of pieces of ice floating on the surface. That's where the crew comes in. Sometimes the radar has a really hard time finding the difference between sea ice and an iceberg. Uh, you know, an iceberg is coming from a glacier, normally from Greenland, and sea ice is just the uh, surface of the ocean that's frozen. It all looks the same to an untrained eye, I guess, so it's just experience. Sometimes if we have multiple bergs, we have to put them in as a cluster. So you say, hey, I see three mediums, two smalls, a couple growlers, and all of that goes in one of those lines that you see him putting in. Uh, latitude, longitude, the time we saw it. All that data is fed into a computer model which creates a predictive map of iceberg locations. The International Ice Patrol was created in 1913 in the aftermath of the Titanic disaster. It has flown in every iceberg season since, except during the two world wars. Now this season is winding down, but for the crew, the things they see from up here don't just get entered in a computer. I mean, even today we were flying only 400, 500 feet off the water, and you're looking down and you're like, man, that's really cool. I actually took video on my phone just because, you know, it, it doesn't really get old. I think the most important thing is this is something that not everybody gets to do, and it, it, it feels special. You feel like you're doing something that's not only important to the maritime community, but it's just so unique. How could you pass it up? Zach Gowdy, CBC News, near the coast of Labrador. The ribbon or the rope has been cut on a new $32 million swimming and recreational facility in the east end of St. John's. We'll take you inside in a few minutes.
The newest rec center in the province is now open for business. It comes with a price tag of $32 million. The Paul Reynolds Center in the east end of St. John's officially opened today. Now the 74,000 square foot facility features a six lane lap pool that you can see here behind me. Two water slides, which I didn't get to use today. Gym areas for seniors and children. Now while I did and I did stop by to get a first hand look at this new rec center. Three, two, one. <laughs> it's a huge day. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, it's, it's the first purpose-built recreation center that we've, that we've had in the city. It's a great building. It's going to be just uh, filled with activity, um, and we're, we're very, very proud of it. The original recreation centre in Wedgwood Park was built by the community of, of Wedgwood Park and uh, we, th we felt that when we replaced that, that it was important to recognise the people who built that community. One of the rooms is named after my mother who was, who we lived, moved into Wedgwood Park when we were in the 1960s and she was really active in the community. She was on the first uh, uh, recreation commission so she was uh, one of the pioneers in the recreational life of Wedgwood Park. Oh, we were so pleased. My mother would be delighted by this. She was a, a real advocate for Wedgwood Park. Dad still lives up the street, actually. So we are just, we are just so happy that this has happened for Mom. Well, I'm here today uh, because this beautiful facility has uh, been dedicated uh, to me, it's been named uh, after me. Be able to, you know, come down here and see my name above the pool, which is wonderful. And it's also really fantastic that the city recognized um, my accomplishments, even though, you know, it was a number of years ago. Uh, but it's still really wonderful that way, and um, it means a lot. It's a huge day. We're all so proud to, uh, to see what, what the old rec center was and to see this state-of-the-art multi-million dollar facility. It's, it's very impressive and, and we're all very, very proud today. First of all, he would have been very pleased for the people of the community and he, I'm sure he would have lined up a dozen names that should have been on this building ahead of his, uh, but he would be, uh, he'd be very happy for the people of Wedgwood Park and St. John's. The wood is actually the door to the, to the uh, council chambers in the town of Wedgwood Park, so uh, we had the doors, they were in storage in the, in the rec centre, so uh, our staff uh, came up with the idea of incorporating it into that, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty special, so uh, it's just another one of the details that, uh, that you'll see throughout facility, this facility. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. What a great looking spot, yeah. that new rec center. You had a pretty good look around. I did, but I didn't have as close of a look as I would have liked. I was hoping to get a chance to go swimming, but yeah. I didn't want to ruin my TV here, oh. so I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I took it easy. I know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was great. What an, a great addition to the community to have a facility like that. It'll be well used. It certainly sure. will be. And now it's open for the public if people want to go stop by and go for a dip or uh, play in the gym. Yeah, mm -hmm. Such a difference between what it was before and what it is now and just like that uh, what a difference tomorrow is going to be compared to the weather today. Let's uh, start though uh, with looking at uh, temperatures across Canada. This is how things are looking right now. You can see right now it's just nine degrees in St. John's much nicer in Lab City 17. Nice hot summery temperatures right across the country but it is a bit cooler in Vancouver at 14 at the moment. This is a recap of how your day is looking tomorrow. We have 21 degrees and some sun and cloud in St. John's tomorrow. Central Newfoundland is looking beautiful. 27 degrees, some nice southwesterly winds keeping things warm. On the west coast, uh, Corner Brook, those showers you see there won't hit the area until later in the afternoon. Uh, but temperatures are great, 24 degrees. And uh, up in Happy Valley Goose Bay, you can expect some thunder showers there tomorrow. 25 degrees, pretty heavy rain, 5 to 15 millimeters expected there. And uh, what a difference in temperature between Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City tomorrow. Just 12 degrees expected as the high there. So tomorrow night, things are going to start to change once again. You can see this band of showers moving across Labrador 
offshore there, but this system is just headed straight for the island overnight on Friday. You can see 10 o'clock on the west coast. Uh, pretty heavy rain there as well up through Labrador there. If you're heading downtown on uh, Saturday night at about 1 a.m., you can see there's going to be some pretty heavy rain, so you'll want to take your umbrella for sure. And you can see the whole island really is just engulfed with uh, this wet weather uh, overnight on Saturday. And that will continue through until Saturday morning, but slowly throughout the day it will start to move off. So it'll still be drizzly around noon on Saturday uh, and some heavier rain still sticking around in southeastern Labrador and the northern peninsula. But you can see it starts to move off uh, by Saturday evening. It'll be fairly clear in the east, but still some lingering showers on the northern peninsula there. So temperatures dipping down a little bit again, uh, just 15 as the high uh, in St. John's on Saturday and similar temperatures right across uh, the island, 14 as the high uh, in western Newfoundland and uh, similar actually in uh, Labrador, just 16 with some showers and sun and cloud in western Labrador, 14 degrees there. So Saturday night, like I said, everything is uh, moving off. So it'll be quite a nice Saturday night, actually. And into Sunday morning, you can see it'll stay fairly clear. Another system starts moving in uh, across Labrador on Sunday afternoon, and that will start heading towards the island as well. So Sunday afternoon is actually looking like a great day in the east, 18 degrees with sun and cloud. I'm going to be out in my garden for sure. Uh, in central Newfoundland, 19 degrees with some sun and cloud and chance of showers that will be moving in later in the day in western Newfoundland and uh, some showers uh, across Labrador as well. So you can see things will start to cool down a little bit again as we begin uh, the work week uh, in for most of the island there and uh, it's looking pretty nice for Wednesday in Labrador with 17 degrees there and a mix of sun and cloud. Okay, let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Lana Smith from Paradise. She's a dancer with the Elite Dance Studio. She's nine years old. She studies jazz and modern dance and is part of the mini white competition team. Recently, the team received many top awards at the 5678 competition. Lana plans to add tumble gymnastics to her repertoire this summer. Congratulations, Lana. You are our young athlete of the day.
Welcome back to Here and Now. In international news, all, all eyes were on Washington today as the former head of the FBI testified before U.S. lawmakers. James Comey answered questions about his conversations with President Donald Trump about a variety of issues. The Russia investigation, General Michael Flynn, Trump's demand for Comey's loyalty, and whether he believes the president obstructed justice. Paul Hunter reports. Under intense pressure and over-the-top anticipation, James Comey came to Capitol Hill ostensibly to tell all. What did he say? Not least that he believes President Donald Trump to be a liar. Director Comey, you're now under oath. On being fired as FBI director in part because, as the White House then put it, the FBI was in disarray. Those were lies, plain and simple. And on why he took careful notes about his private conversations with Trump. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting, and so I thought it really important to document. But a key aspect of today's Senate hearing, examining whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia to meddle in last year's election, is whether Trump has obstructed justice, an impeachable offense. Says Comey, in a conversation about Mike Flynn, the former national security advisor, then under criminal investigation over his contacts with Russia, Trump said to Comey, I hope you can see your way to letting this go. Comey's view, that meant curtail the investigation. I took it as a direction. Right. I mean, as the President of the United States, with me alone saying, I hope this, I took it as this is what he wants me to do. Now, I didn't, I didn't obey that, but that's the way I took it. Is that obstruction? I don't think it's for me to say whether the conversation I had with the President was an effort to obstruct. I took it as a very disturbing thing, very concerning. Equally significant, said Comey, is that he believes the actual reason he was fired was to impede the FBI's investigation into that Russian meddling. And to those who don't believe him on those meetings with Trump, he challenged the president, who's hinted there may be secret audio tapes of their conversations, says Comey. If so, release them. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. While most of America and the world is captivated by the former FBI director's testimony in Washington, premiers from eight Canadian provinces and territories are there to prepare for NAFTA renegotiations. Now that's a group that includes Premier Dwight Ball. The premiers said the, out, the ongoing scandals with the Trump administration and uncertainty around policy decision makes trade talks difficult. But as policymakers, they need to be ready if and when the renegotiations go ahead. Now, most leaders don't want a complete overhaul, but they are in favor of making small changes and adding missing things to modernize the free trade agreement. Now, we want to give you a warning about this next piece of video. This is raw, closed-circuit images of the deadly police takedown of the London Bridge attackers. It shows just how rapid and chaotic the situation was as it played out. Officers using deadly force when the terror suspects charged at them armed with knives. Now again, some of you at home may find these images disturbing. So what you're seeing is eight police officers getting out of their car and then starting to fire at the three attackers. The officers fired a total of 46 shots after the attackers rushed towards them. Now the whole incident happened just minutes after the three attackers drove into pedestrians on London Bridge and then stabbed people in Borough Market, leaving eight dead. More bodies have been found in Myanmar from the plane that crashed into the sea yesterday. Fishermen helped Navy personnel carry bodies to shore today. The plane was flying from the far south of the country carrying 122 people, 14 crew and 108 passengers. It was a military flight, but some of those on board were civilians, including children. The plane disappeared from radar about 30 minutes into the flight. It was raining in the area, but not heavily. Well, it is the, a first for Canadian tennis, and it happened on the red clay at the storied French Open. Gabriella Dabrowski of Ottawa became the first Canadian woman to win a Grand Slam title. The 25-year-old and her partner from India, Rohan Bopana, saved two match points in the tiebreak and then won on their opponent's double fault. Dabrowski and Bopana advanced to the final in impressive fashion. They didn't drop a set in the tournament.
And welcome back once again. Raccoons are known to be great climbers, but this one may have gotten a bit ahead of himself. The four-legged critter was found up a tree in Fredericton with only his head and le <laughs> legs poking out. <laughs> Trash panda. We're not quite sure whether the animal was stuck or just hanging out trying to get some shut eye. You will be pleased to hear he did manage to free himself eventually. Help me. <laughs> well, here's something else you don't see every day in your own backyard. Joanne and Steve Gibson from Nova Scotia discovered a mother cub and her three, sorry, mother bear and her three cubs. They took these photos from the safety of their second floor balcony. They say they're very careful to take in bird feeders and garbage so they don't attract wildlife. But these bears look like they just wanted to play. Maybe they are smarter than the average bear. <laughs> it's uh, not all that common to see three cubs like that. Okay, not. we're on the nature part of the program tonight. Basically, yes. Yeah, now to the dead whale in Outer Cove last evening. It was finely towed away, as we showed you, on the back of an 18-wheeler. So one of our editors, Daryl Murphy, put together this time-lapse of the removal operation. Have a look. larger than when we saw it floating. Yeah, I think Mark Quinn was saying that, that we estimated that it was 10 tons, and it was actually, I think the mayor told him that it was 20 tons, so twice as big as they originally thought, because that truck there that's dragging it away had a scale on it, so they were able to weigh how much it actually was. What a big mess of a whale, but now that problem is gone. And what a big yeah, relief, I'm sure, for uh, the residents living uh, near that because uh, it's kind of stinky, isn't it? And it would get even stinkier tomorrow because it's going to be nice and hot here in the east. 21 degrees uh, in St. John's tomorrow. This is kind of a look at the next 48 hours. Kind of a big difference between uh, tomorrow and Saturday, 27 uh, on Friday and uh, Saturday, 16 degrees. So this is a look at uh, your temperatures over uh, as we start the weekend uh, this weekend. So I just wanted to show you guys this oh picture. Look Speaking about that. massive things, <laughs> this, just look at this iceberg compared to those houses. It's so long. That's massive. Like, yeah, where is that? It? Oh, St. Brendan's. That's St. Brendan's in Shoal Cove. Uh, Incredible. Yeah, just gorgeous. So thank you very much to Tracy Hines for sending that in. She posted that on Ryan's uh, Facebook page. Oh, I bet you that breeze off that is pretty cool. Oh, anyway, boy. thanks, Tracy. Well, <laughs> thanks hope, to you. And hopefully it won't be very cool for us here tomorrow <laughs> on the Avalon. We'll no. see you tomorrow night. <laughs>